The Verge. Bird has a new electric scooter. It's durable. Comes in three different colors, and you can buy it. Bird Zero is intended to be a more rugged scooter that could take the beating and keep rolling for an average of 10 months, CEO. Van der Zanden predicts it will stay in circulation for at least 12 months. The company plans to phase out all of its consumer-grade scooters over the summer. Bird says it will continue to use the Xiaomi M365 models for monthly personal rentals, and it will no longer purchase the 9-bot ES scooters. Scooter companies have been struggling to turn a profit since bursting into the scene almost two years ago. It all comes down to unit economics, how much revenue each individual scooter brings in for a company, and the most important number to consider is the lifespan of each scooter. The more trips and miles a scooter a single scooter can cover the better is for the scooter companies that can recoup the cost of each vehicle before they can start making money bird manufactured bird zero scooters in cooperation with OK, a chinese scooter company but they're under nda for whoever manufactures the bird one scooter it's available in three colors jet black dove white and electric rose the bird one and the bird zero very confusing their model names there pre-orders are open i had amazon at a not expensive price of thirteen hundred dollars Xiaomi's Mi Scooter sells for $440 on Amazon, while Swagtron retails for around $300. Bird says its Bird 1 scooters will have a 437, 473 watt hour battery that gives the scooter range for 30 miles on a single charge. Other upgrades include a GPS enabled anti theft device, 9 inch semi solid pneumatic tires, and a digital lock that can be locked and unlocked from Bird's smartphone app. The scooter tops out 19 miles an hour and it can carry a max weight of 220 pounds. If your scooter breaks down, you can bring it in or mail it to one of Bird's server centers located in North America and Europe. If the scooter is stolen, Bird's Bird Hunter Network freelancers may be able to track it down and find it. These are independent contractors and there are no guarantees on recovery. What? Yeah. I, I have a lot of questions about that. First, we talked about this last week where we looked at how much a Bird scooter costs. Yeah. And we agree with those figures of about 448, 500, yeah. 600 maybe. But. Yeah, but now they're at 13 for these damn scooters. Yeah. And then I like how they also are tracking you through this bird hunter thing. Yeah. They're selling it as a feature, yep. but meanwhile, what other data are they collecting? What yes. are they learning? Now, if you want to go get a, you know, a license, you can get a gasoline-powered scooter, those little Vespa-looking ones that you sit down on for $700 on Amazon. Yeah. They go faster, you sit down, they're more comfortable. Might as well just get that then. Yeah. <laughs> <'Cause it's, laughs> unless you want the... That's crazy expensive, though. That is a very expensive scooter. $1,200, $1,300 for a scooter. Democracy now. Gig economy, driver strike. Uber has built its $90 billion empire on an anti-worker model. So they're at this protest in New York, interviewing an Uber driver. Let's hear what he has to say. My name is Inder Parmar. I've been driving for Uber since 2013, and my income has been dropped, but drastically, because when I was working with Uber, it was $3 a mile, and I used to get $2.60 a mile. Today, I get $1.15 a mile. And when I was driving in 2013-14, there was 30, 40,000 drivers. Today is 160,000 drivers. My payment has, my income has been drastically decreased from $37 an hour to about $10 an hour, and it's very, very hard to support my family and to myself yeah Jeez. it's been a common complaint amongst uber drivers is the wages are just getting lower and lower and lower yeah it's i mean it's crazy yeah and someone in the chat brings up lyft they're not completely innocent in this just yeah. Uber's much bigger and driving 80 hours and still part-time Okay. In 2013-14, I was driving 70, 80 hours. And I went to the office, and they said, all the Uber drivers are part-time drivers. I said, excuse me, I worked 80 hours last week, and you tell me I'm a part-time driver? He said, Uber policy is to have only part-time drivers, not a full-time driver. I said, then I'm worked 80 hours. You still call me a part-time driver? He said, yes, the one of the managers over there. That he said all the drivers are part-time drivers. That's how Uber wants. They want every driver to be a part-time driver. It's freaking nuts. Yeah, exploitation. Nuts. Driving 80 hours. Yeah. And not even an employee, a full-time employee, you're part-time. Wow. Uh, how much does it cost to be an Uber driver? To work as an Uber driver, my expenses are average about $10 an hour. Okay, and if it, when I make ten dollars an hour, I'm just meeting my expenses. I'm not taking any money to my house, to myself. To me, this IPO is an exploitation, and if anybody buys this IPO, they are becoming a member of an exploitation. And of course, he's bringing up the IPO. These strikes were, of course, coordinated right before the IPO, just as kind of a a jab at Uber. Yeah. Taxi driver suicides. 
a spike in suicides by, by drivers here in New York City. Uh, can you talk about that and the, the devastation that this leads to to people's lives? Okay, I'll tell. Most of these drivers were yellow cab drivers. They took a million dollar loan on their medallions and they could not make the payments. And the banks were foreclosing on their houses and on their accounts. All those things were getting frozen and they could not take that thing. If you see two years ago, taxi newspapers had no advertisement for suicide help. Today, every taxi newspaper have half a page of ad telling the drivers not to commit suicide. Come to them for help. Dang. Yeah. And well, we hadn't heard about this, but we looked into it. And yeah, New York Times actually wrote a story about it. We're not going to get into it. It'll be in the show notes. Uber driver's death marks seventh for hired driver suicide within a year. That was back in October 2018. Yeah. But they're talking about how this is becoming, how first it was just the taxi drivers. Now the Uber drivers are becoming part of that because the Uber drivers are putting the taxi drivers out of work and yeah. hurting their business. And now it's just everyone's hurting. Yeah, it's it kind of feels like. All right, now Democracy Now! went and talked to an, an organizer, I think she is. Well, let's take a look about the economy and the strike details. It was absolutely amazing. Um, there were strikes across every single... Yeah, yeah. New York Taxi Workers Alliance, that's what it is, sorry. <laughs> also, and why did you yeah. say it was amazing? I know, hold on. Just the way she says it. I know I left that in there on purpose. Yes. It was absolutely amazing. Um, there were strikes across every single continent. The United States, there were several cities, and it was just a rolling strike for over a 24-hour period. It's the first time that we've ever seen this among drivers. And why was it scheduled just as Uber is about to go public? Well, it was timed with the IPO. Um, in its pre-IPO filing called, you know, the S-1 to the Securities and Exchange Commission, Uber unabashedly notes in there that they expect driver dissatisfaction to only increase. They <laughs> what? Wow. They actually expect it. That's horrible. I mean, these drivers already make minimum wage. <laughs> I don't know how much more upset the drivers can get, to be honest yeah. with you, but okay. Expect to cut driver pay, to cut incentives, and move quickly into driverless vehicles. And this uh -oh. is all after also acknowledging that the vast majority of drivers earn below minimum wage. Wait, what? So yeah. they're depending on AI to eventually yep. get rid of the driver? More on that later. This is crazy. Uh, gig economy, Uber's model is anti-worker. Well, the business model is so fundamentally anti-worker. You know, um, Uber saturated the streets with vehicles, and then they continued to cut the rate of, pay of fare that the drivers would be paid by. And so, as you know, as Inder was saying, you're competing with so many more people, and you're getting paid less per fare. On top of that, you're paying um, heavy costs for vehicles to rent or to buy in order to go to work with them. Yeah, and it, it's Uber's model to beat the taxi companies is anti-worker. Yeah. They have to cut costs somewhere, and they're going to cut it at the worker. I, that's, that's their business model. And everyone likes the, the cheap fares of Uber and Lyft, so if they start raising prices, people are going to use them even less. People don't use them very often. I'd be curious to know how much people use them. I mean, they envision, though, this society where no mm. one drives and they just use their services, but yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. And here's a clip talking about Uber and taxi drivers teaming up in a way, which is not good for Uber. Well, in, in New York City, our, out of our 21,000 members, about 10,000 of them actually drive for Uber or Lyft. We started out as a yellow cab driver's organization back in 98, but over the past five years, as more of our members started to drive for Uber and Lyft, they retained the membership, and, and there's one of our members. We have a unity platform, because as he said, this is fundamentally about the race to the bottom. Uber starves the Uber driver so they can starve the taxi driver. So both mm -hmm. groups of drivers need to stand together against this business model. So Yeah, it's going to really, yeah. it's interesting. <laughs> Were there yellow taxi cab drivers who moved entirely to Uber? And if so, why? 
there, it's been a revolving door of desperation because in the beginning, you know, Uber offered bonuses and promotions, you know, $60,000 guaranteed. Federal Trade Commission investigation actually found that only 10 percent of the drivers ever grossed what Uber had actually promised. Uber ended up settling for a $20 million fine because of false advertising. Jeez. <laughs> Uber's just, they have a bad record with employees. Yeah. Is that TV working for you, by the way? Oh, it is now. should have told me. should have said something. Oh. I always want that TV on for you. Last clip from Democracy Now! Sorry. Uh, gig economy. Closing up. 44 seconds. First. Well, you know, um, the gig economy, whether it's Uber, Lyft, or Handy, or TaskRabbit, anytime... What's Handy? <laughs> Pretty sure it's the handyman service. And, oh, uh, you know, not not anything else. Wishful but who thinking. Knows? <laughs> Wishful thinking. Workers have demanded, you know, a decent pay, you know, livable incomes and job security, dignified work. They responded by saying, "Well, this isn't supposed to be full time. This is part time." Uber's gone as far as to say. By part-time, we mean just a couple of hours here and there each week. Every time we raise the bar to just get to the floor of basic employment protections, you know, um, they lower the expectation of what this is actually supposed to be. When they lobby, they call it a job. Once they get the drivers in, they call it a gig. Gig economy. Yeah. It's sad. It's really depressing. It really I have is. those. The uh, scooters fit into that. The people that yeah. are charging them, it's a gig. That's why I don't like gig them. Gig economy, everybody. Can we open our eyes and yeah. get away from this? Uh, and you can t tell it, too, in the way they try to sell their business, too. Oh, mm -hmm. you're just on the way to work, and then you can pick up somebody. Yeah, or, yeah, like Amazon. Like, yeah, right. That's not how it's going to work. Or, it's not how work works. Yeah. It's not just one of those things. Just do it on your free time. Yeah. Whenever you have free time. Because your car has to be clean and ready, and and then people can tell, I think, which drivers are more or less experienced, and, of course, they want you to be friendly and know where you're going. Uh, yeah, I, I have know. I have that website if you want to just compare Lyft and Uber. Yeah, if you'd like to do that before we go into CNBC. Yeah, just to show that, you know, they're basically the same. So let's not demonize Uber. It's just Uber does have a lot more bookings, as you can see. Well, I will say that Lyft introduced tipping yeah. with their initial launch. But, and it uh, took Uber a very long time to do that. That's true, but it's just more. Yeah, it's more of the same. More competition, mm -hmm. lowering wages. Mm-hmm. But Lyft is growing, so there's a revenue, so revenue's increasing. But interestingly, we must remember that they're still, they're not making any money off of this business model either. So they're just depending on investors. So that's what we're kind of seeing with Uber, especially it's investing so much money yep. in oh, the yeah. scooters. In the chat, you're correct. Uber does have a lot of controversies, a lot. Sexual harassment scandals from the, all kinds of weird stuff in, with yeah. Uber. So cost and expensive. So this is expensive business. And if these workers continue to demand fair wages, they're not going to be making money. <laughs> nope. And let's talk about that. CNBC, why Uber is losing money. Uber is far from making money. It reported an operating loss of $3 billion in 2018 after losing more than $4 billion the prior year. During its roadshow, Uber compared itself to Amazon as it explained its money-losing business to investors. Why am I like this because they actually explain, well, why Amazon's <laughs> a little different. Amazon? Because the now wildly successful company didn't make a profit for several years after it went public in 1997. But Uber isn't Amazon. For one, Amazon had little competition in the e-commerce space when it IPO'd. It also had a valuation of $438 million, compared to Uber's $75 billion. What? Yep. <sighs> Uber overview. CNBC. Uber was founded as UberCab in 2009 by Garrett Camp and Travis Kalanick. The app launched in San Francisco in July 2010. It allowed users to hail, via an app, black town cars, but was still more expensive than taking a taxi. It then dropped cab from its name and launched in New York City and Paris. But in 2012, another ride-hailing company entered the market. 
you had Lyft come into the picture and they came around and said, you know, we're gonna give Uber some competition on the lower priced end of things. And from that came Uber X, which is now sort of Uber as we know it, the cheap alternative to hailing a taxi. Uber now operates in 63 countries, 700 cities, Ooh. and has completed over 5 billion rides. Jeez. Wow. There are also more than 3 million Uber drivers worldwide. That's quite a lot of employees. Or, I mean, I mean, part-time contractors. Yeah, do they want to turn gig, into gig robots? Contractors. Yeah. <laughs> robots. That's a lot of robots. Once we have 5G everywhere. Yes, AI. <laughs> and then now, why is Uber losing money? Here they explain it. First, they have to pay drivers. And now, drivers are asking for more. <laughs> drivers, united, will never be defeated. Increased competition with Lyft has created tensions with drivers who complain of low pay rates and unfair compensation. It's expensive to navigate the regulatory environment in each city and to ensure the business. Insurance costs for Uber ride-sharing products increased $1.3 billion from 2016 Damn. to 2017. Ooh. Credit card processing fees and driver incentives also drain the company of money. On the rider side, they also have to make it appealing, entice the rider to come to Uber and use its platform instead of going to Lyft. So in this way, Uber and Lyft both spend millions and millions of dollars to attract and keep people on their platforms. It's not a moneymaker right now. Yeah. Last clip from CNBC. Revenue and AI. Uber's total revenue for 2018 was $11.3 billion, with ride-sharing bringing in over 80%. Uber Eats is the second biggest source of revenue for the company at $1.4 billion. But Uber has put a lot of focus on diversifying into bike-sharing, scooters, Uber Freight, air taxis, and even its own <laughs> autonomous driving technology, yeah. all of which require a lot of investment and has slowed growth towards profitability. Mm. If you believe that this industry and Uber and Lyft are going to be profitable, you believe that at some point in the future, self-driving cars are going to help them get there. And I'm sure people in our chat agree. Yeah. They think that self-driving cars are going to they're going to help Uber get there. Let's continue on with the clip. Uber's Advanced Technologies Group, or ATG, which works on self-driving vehicles, cool. recently announced a $1 billion investment from SoftBank, Denso, and Toyota. Assigned investors may see it's serious about long-term growth. ATG took a hiatus after one of Uber's self-driving cars killed a woman in Arizona last Ooh. year. Always bad. Yeah. Fatality. So, AI and self-driving cars, they're going to save Uber, make them profitable. Yeah, Joe we'll, Rogan. We'll talk more on that later. Joe Rogan had a research scientist at MIT actually working on human-centered AI. Unless you want to talk about this anymore. Got anything else to say on Uber? I think we're good. All right. All well, right. Again, a scientist at MIT working on human-centered AI and autonomous vehicles. Lex Friedman on his show, Joe Rogan Experience. Let's listen to see what this guy has to say about self-driving cars. One of the uh, big assumptions of us human beings is that we think that driving is actually pretty easy and we think that humans suck at driving. Those two assumptions. We think like driving, it, you know, you stay in the lane, you stop at the stop sign, it's pretty easy to, to automate. And then the other one is you think like humans are terrible drivers and so it'll be easy to build a machine that outperforms humans at driving. Now there's, that's, uh, I think, there's a lot of flaws behind that intuition. We take for granted how hard it is to look at the scene, like everything you just did, picked up, moved around some objects. It's really difficult to build an artificial intelligence system that does that. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. And people don't appreciate that. And everyone likes to say, oh, you know, jokingly, people are bad drivers, but not really. I think they just make dumb choices. Yeah. But in the yeah. act of driving, are they actually bad at it? Well, I think two people would be much better drivers if they weren't distracted. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> we kind of forget that. Yep, carry it on with Lex Friedman. Yeah. Friedman, Friedman. To be able to perceive and understand the scene enough to understand the physics of the scene, like all these objects, that it, like how to pick them up, the texture of those objects, the weight, to understand glasses folded and unfolded, open water bottle, all those things is common sense knowledge that we take for granted. We think it's trivial, but there is no artificial system in the world today, nor will there be for perhaps quite a while that can reason, do that kind of common sense reasoning about the physical world. Yeah. That's, quite, that's a challenge. If you've got cars with 
artificial intelligence driving around. They have to know what the physical world, don't they? Don't they? Yeah. I mean, just think about if you see a plastic bag blowing through on the freeway. Yeah. Is AI going to be able to distinguish fashion enough if, if that's a bag and how much that weighs and what's the force of that going to be against the car versus... Try to avoid it. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's, ah, it's, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, and, and that's trivial for us, but it's not for a computer and people forget that. One more clip with a very good question in here. I like this question. Add to that... Uh, pedestrians uh, so add some crazy people in this room right now to the whole scene right and being able to notice like this guy's an asshole look at him what's he doing what is he doing get off that skateboard oh jesus he's in traffic yep and the considering not that he's an asshole he's a respectable skateboarder uh <laughs> <laughs> it that in order to make him behave a certain way you yourself have to behave a certain way so it's not just you have to perceive the world you have to act in a way like you have to assert your presence in this world. You have to take risks. So in order to make the skateboarder not cross the street, you have to perhaps accelerate if you have the right of way. And these are that there's a game theoretic, right. a game of chicken to get right. I mean, we don't even know how to approach that as a as a artificial intelligence sort of research community and also as a society. Do we want an autonomous vehicle that speeds up in order to make uh, a pedestrian not cross the street. Mm. Ooh, do we want that? I, I assume people would not. Do you want a self-driving car that'll speed up to make a pedestrian not cross the street? I just don't want a self-driving car. Because <laughs> <but. laughs> I what we sorry. Oh, I was gonna say I don't trust it to play a chicken. No, I. It's a computer. I don't, I don't yeah. trust computers. They crash all the time. <laughs> Carry it on. We do all the time. We have to assert our presence. If there's a if there's a person who doesn't have the right of way who begins crossing, we're going to either maintain speed or speed up potentially if we want them to not cross. So that that game there to get that right. That's a dangerous game for a robot. It's for a robot and for us to be rationally, <clears throat> if that God forbid leads to fatality, for us right. as a society to rationally reason about that and think about that. Yeah. What do you think of that guy? I think that guy uses LSD mushrooms. Oh my God. <laughs> just, just ask a question. Just ask. Uh, I don't know. Ask at healthytalkshow.com. Let us know what you think. I have one more if you want. Yeah. About the Mountain View Tesla. I, I've heard of a lot about this, but he oh, has some interesting. Yeah, because that sounded like what happened with the mm -hmm. story we discussed last time. Yeah. So there was, uh, I believe, in uh, Mountain View, a fatality in a Tesla where it. This is a common problem for all all lane keeping systems like like Tesla Autopilot is uh, there was a divider in the highway and basically the car was driving you know along the lane and then the car in front moved to an adjacent lane and this divider appeared right so you have to now steer to the right and the car didn't and it went straight into the divider oh wow and it you know uh, the, basically what that boils down to is the car drifted out of lane. Right or didn't adjust properly to the lane, and those kinds of things happen. And this is because the person was allowing the autopilot to do everything. The, nope, that you can't. So we have to be extremely careful here. Yes, I don't know the, the really deep details of the case. I'm not sure exactly how many people will do. So there's a judgment on what the people the person was doing, and then there's analysis of what the system did. Right, the system did it drifted out of lane. The question is, did the person, was the person paying attention? And was there enough time given for the person to take over? And if they were paying attention to catch the vehicle, steer back onto the road. Mm. As far as I believe, uh, the only information they have is hands on steering wheel. And they were saying that like half the, half the minute leading up to the crash, the hands weren't on the steering wheel or something like that. Basically trying to infer were the person paying attention or not. But we don't have the information exactly. What were, Where were their eyes? Right. You can, you can only make guesses, uh, as far as I know, again. Dang. Really interesting. Really interesting. I would recommend you check out at least that clip, which we linked to yeah. in our show notes, if you want to check it out. It's a 10-minute. No, oh, it was a long one. It's 30 minutes. It was a long clip. <laughs> But I'm also, keep your eyes on the road. The, these things are not as trustworthy as we think they are. 
you know, don't think that they think like us. Don't think that they can yeah, they react can, like a human. Can't negotiate. Yeah, like they we can't can. reason. No. Humans are very good at adapting and dealing with the unexpected. Yes. So we can change. We can figure out things. And I always think of too, I when you think about trying to train a robot to pick up a wine glass. Yeah. It, it has a really hard time because it yeah. doesn't have the delicate touch. It doesn't understand the physical world like we do. No. And it, all this machine learning, it's not how we learn. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. It's, it's not like they're sitting robots in front of TVs and saying, okay, learn. Yeah. <laughs> That's, uh, moving on. The Verge. Instagram will begin blocking hashtags that return anti-vaccination misinformation. Instagram will begin hiding search results for hashtags that consistently return false information about vaccines. Instagram will effectively begin blocking access to hashtags that return misinformation designed to dissuade people from getting vaccinated. Instagram will review posts that are being removed under misinformation policies and use medical, excuse me, machine learning (laughs) to understand which hashtags they are associated with. Machine learning. If a hashtag has a high proportion of misinformation, it will be blocked. Instagram also plans to introduce a pop-up message for people searching for vaccine information, linking them to high-quality information about the subject. It has not yet finalized the wording of the message, but it hopes to introduce it soon, the company said. All right. So, of course, we're going to say that our problems with this is who decides the standards. Who's deciding the standards of information. Yeah. And then it's not like computers can be trained to be these all-knowing things. They're they're programmed by humans with different scenarios. Mm -hmm. Humans have bias. Yeah. Our Instagram and Twitter, though, if you'd like to follow us, Healthy Talk Show, drop the W at the end. So it's kind of weird, but it's Twitter and Instagram if you want to follow us. We promote things. We do things. Someone throw it up in the chat if you get a chance. Swag Lord's there. He'll do it. Moving right along. Tech Radar, a single student has solved the problem of cheap, non-invasive glucose testing. U.S. student Brian Chang appears to have done what several decades of big pharma investment, the billions of the Google Innovation Fund, Apple, and numerous failed medical startups have managed, haven't managed. He's cracked the impossible problem of checking a person's blood glucose level without having to smear some actual blood on a sensor or poke a wire into the skin. That's cool. This yeah. non-invasive dream has remained elusive due to the complexities in spotting blood glucose molecule- molecules through the barrier of the, our skin, with numerous failed schemes promising bloodless sci-fi test results before disappearing without a trace, or at least not talking about their plan since 2014. This includes a promising but presumably still fictional glucose, glucowise, to quote one, but one example of promised teletech solution has so far failed to materialize, but Chang said his phone seemed to have done it. Microsoft has handed its 100,000 2019 Imagine Cup Innovation Award to Chang, whose non-invasive easy glucose testing appeared method appears to both ex- exist and work. It uses custom lenses attached to a smartphone to generate a high-res image of eye for analysis, then via the mysterious modern tech solve methods of deep learning, neural networks, and Chang's own algorithms accurately associate minor changes in the ridges and features of the iris and the human eye to, to glucose levels within the bloodstream. The crucial thing now is to match the claimed results to the hype. We saw Google literally pretend that it was possible to read glucose levels in tears a few years ago, but the Smart Contact Lens Project was quietly binned recently when medical development partners discovered that it didn't actually work at all. Thanks, Google. Yeah, this pretty seems cool. pretty cool. If it works, I please, please work. We yeah. The non-invasive glucose testing. All right, moving right along. Uh, well, let's just open Stanford at a study. Let's play a clip. We find a big difference between people who played Pokemon in their childhood versus those who didn't. Um, and so those people who are Pokemon experts not only develop a unique brain representation for Pokemon and visual cortex, but the most interesting part to us is that the location of that response to Pokemon is consistent across people. What? This is pretty cool. It's insane. That's so cool. Clip two. The people we were looking to scan played a lot of Pokemon in their childhood, so somewhere between 1995 and 1998, they were five and eight years old. These are 
subjects who can name hundreds of Pokemon, they have almost lifelong visual experience beginning in childhood with Pokemon. And then the other group of people that we were looking for were people that were the exact opposite. They never played Pokemon, they have nothing, know nothing about it. We put them in an fMRI scanner and then shows them different kinds of stimuli. So they'll see common stimuli such as faces or places or, or words or objects and also they'll be seeing a Pokemon stimuli. It's pretty cool. Yep. They should have signed me up for the Pokemon. Yeah, I know. Stanford. One more clip. The Pokemon region that we observed, it was in high-level visual cortex, the part of the brain that's involved in recognizing things like words and faces. It helps us pinpoint which theory of brain organization might be the most responsible for determining how your visual cortex develops from childhood to adulthood. Basically looking at them at the central vision and because they were really small, place them in the particular fold of the brain that we know gets input from the central part of your retina or central vision. So if you look at Pokemon, they're very small and they, you use your central vision. Where the heck are they getting all those Game Boy Pockets from though? <laughs> they know, send See, us I haven't some. seen one of those in a while. HealthyTalkShow.com slash support. So they land in a part of your, the center of your retina, whereas stimuli like this room, for example, go to the periphery of your retina. And so because they have different locations on your retina, they have different locations in your brain. And it turns out what? that the Pokemon region emerges in a part of your brain that responds to information from the center of your retina. And so that finding suggests that the very way that you look at a visual stimulus, like a Pokemon or words, determines why your brain is organized the way it is. And that's useful going forward because it might suggest that visual deficits like dyslexia or face blindness might result simply from the way you look at stimuli. And so that's, it's a promising. That's really cool. Yeah, it's super cool. Especially, you know, dyslexia. I know all about that. Yeah. It makes me think all, all kinds of possibilities. It's very interesting. Good old Stanford. Any more clips or? Nope, that's it. Yeah, Stanford just to recap why mm -hmm. this is important, mm -hmm. if we can figure out how people learn and s store information in their brain, and like like they found, everyone that uh, had Pokemon, it was all stored in the same in like spot, so this mm -hmm. tells us how memories are generated, and then yeah, we can start figuring out how to treat dyslexia, or maybe figure out what causes other disabilities, other learning disabilities, what parts of the brain are affected. It was pretty interesting. Oh, that was a really cool study. Yeah. Plus Pokemon. I know. Who doesn't love Pokemon? And, you know, I'm sure Detective Pikachu just came out. You know, oh, good timing. Yeah. Who funded this story? <laughs> 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 I should have looked into that. Just kidding. I think Stanford funded it. <laughs> it, was a, it was a pretty good study. Yeah. Thank you so much for watching. For more Healthy Talk Show, please consider subscribing to our podcast over at HealthyTalkShow.com slash subscribe. It's free. Twitter and Instagram, at Healthy Talk Show, drop the W. We record the podcast live Mondays at 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time over at HealthyTalkShow.com slash live. Love and light.